Hey everyone and welcome back to another background tutorial. This demonstration was originally supposed to be part of the Vivarium conversion series, but I decided to make it its own entity. I did this because this background method can be used in a Vivarium, Aquariums, and other similar applications. Additionally, we have to go over the basics on various techniques that you can use on other projects. That said, I will show you more advanced uses for these techniques in the near future. Anyways, as I was making backgrounds, I tried to come up with a way to best replicate a rock wall of sorts. I thought back to some classes I had in college about sculpting and mold making. I tried to come up with the cheapest method possible incorporating some of what I learned. Note, this is not a budget background build. You're going to have to fork out some cash initially to get the supplies you need. However, you can make several smaller backgrounds with your materials, so individually, the cost isn't that bad. To begin, you need to measure your aquarium. The measurements need to be exact or slightly smaller. Any larger and we will quickly run into some complications later on. I'd suggest removing about 1 16th of an inch from every side if you're not confident in your measuring abilities. After you obtain your measurements, draw a box on a piece of plywood using these dimensions. I'm just using some scrap 1 8 inch finishing plywood, but whatever you have should work fine. Next, we're going to need some rocks. What better way to make a realistic rock background than with the real thing? You can use whatever rocks you want, and don't worry about if the colors match. We are also going to need some buff clay. If you don't have any rocks or want to carve them out of the clay yourself, go right ahead. Originally I was going to carve the rocks from scratch, and I did two times previously, but the mold making techniques I tried before didn't work. Anyways, place your rocks in a natural looking formation, and fill in the cracks with clay as needed. Using the clay you can extend the rocks, and make cracks or crevices to create a natural looking design. I'm using a wooden bamboo skewer to carve out the clay so that I don't hear metal tools scraping on the rocks. You can also use the side of a rock to create some realistic textures in your clay. It will take a while to manipulate this and make it look natural, but it beats wasting 14 plus hours carving two rock walls from scratch that went to waste. If you can't carve this all in one sitting, just put some damp paper towels on the structure and cover it with a garbage bag. Something to keep in mind as you select rocks and place clay is to keep your structure thicker than a half of an inch. If you go any thinner I can almost guarantee that the background will crack when you try to remove it from the form later on. Also keep in mind that whatever you carve is what you're going to get. There's no guesswork involved with this method. After you've finished making something that you think looks realistic, clean up your workstation. It's important that our area is clean for the next few steps. Next, roll out some clay slabs and create a barrier around your background. This doesn't have to be very thick, just make sure that there are no cracks whatsoever. Also, you want it to be about 2 inches taller than your sculpture itself. Then go around the perimeter of the outside and inside of the barrier to create a tight seal like so. Once you have created a barrier that looks similar to this, we can move on. Now we have to mix up what will be used to cast the background. Here's a two part alginate mix. This is the same stuff the dentist uses to make impressions of your teeth. Alginate has some limitations, but it's relatively inexpensive. Alternatively, you could use a casting silicone which is more expensive, but it can be used a lot longer. This alginate is a one to one mix. One part alginate to one part warm water. Simply put your dry ingredients in first, and then gradually mix in the warm water. It's also good to have a spatula on hand, so that very little alginate goes to waste. That said, when your mixture looks like the consistency of smooth pancake batter, get ready to pour it into your form. We only have about 6 minutes of work time, so there's no time to waste. At this point you can do one of two things. Pour in enough alginate to create a thick mold, say 1.5 to 2 inches thick, or pour in a thin layer of alginate as seen here. Doing so will work better and will allow you to spread your materials as thin as possible. You will see why in a moment. Then let your alginate sit for about 10 minutes. It should feel pretty firm and slightly moist to the touch. 
If you go the suggested route, here's what you will have to do next. Otherwise, you can skip this portion of the build. Enlarge your clay form by about 1 inch on all of the sides. Do not move the alginate during this process. Then create a seal on the clay barrier just like before. Now we will mix up some plaster of Paris. This will be used to create a rigid form that will help the alginate keep its shape. It will also allow you to use a minimal amount of alginate so that you can spread your materials as thin as possible. Plus, plaster of Paris is dirt cheap. To mix your plaster, start out with a bucket of warm to hot water. The warmer the water, the faster the plaster will set. Simply start pouring your plaster powder into the water. If you notice, the plaster sinks right to the bottom. That's important to recognize as you'll see shortly. Keep dumping the plaster in and occasionally stir it into the water. Whenever you start to get icebergs of plaster that do not sink very quickly, your mixture is in good shape. I always like to add a few more scoops once it gets to this point because I prefer to work with a thicker plaster mix. At this point, keep stirring your mixture until you notice that it's becoming difficult to stir, almost like the consistency of a thick milkshake. Now all that you have to do is simply dump the plaster into the form and let it set. I did this before I went to bed and then removed the clay barrier when I came home from work the next day, so it set for about 16 hours or so. I wouldn't suggest going much longer than this because the plaster will suck some of the moisture out of the alginate. At the minimum, I suggest letting it set for around 8 hours. We don't have time to let it set completely, so it will most likely feel moist to the touch. Regardless, it will be strong enough for our intended purpose. Once the clay barrier is removed, flip the entire form over and place it back on the plywood. With any luck, you should end up with a single piece. Now that the clay and rocks are exposed, they can be removed from the alginate. You should be able to peel it all out pretty easily. Afterward, the alginate can be removed from the plaster mold. In essence, what we have created is a negative of our background. Now we have to go and clean any excess clay off of the alginate. Just run it under some water and lightly scrub it as necessary. Then dry it off a bit and place it back into the plaster mold. You probably noticed that on its own, alginate doesn't hold its shape very well. That's one of the reasons why I suggest making the external pot mold. You only have about a day or two to use this alginate mold to its fullest. It will shrink and lose a lot of its moisture very quickly, so once you have it cleaned, get on it. Now we are going to mix up some concrete. On its own, this hydraulic cement mix wouldn't hold its shape. Cement more or less is intended to glue an aggregate together, usually sand and rocks. You could use other cements, but I chose this hydraulic cement because it's meant to be used in wet environments. Here's the mix that I'm using. You could alter it however you see fit, but this is a standard mix that is suggested for applications like this. 3 parts aggregate, 2 parts cement, and 1 part water. Put all of your ingredients together, and then mix it up. Usually it's recommended to mix the dry ingredients first, and then add the water, but it didn't really matter to me. That said, I added additional ingredients to the mix until I liked the consistency. Just like the plaster, this should have a similar consistency to a thick milkshake. If it's too runny, it will likely crack. If it's too dry, it will crumble to pieces. Keep in mind that your concrete will take on the color of your sand to some degree. So you could experiment with different colors or even cement tints to achieve different colors, but I'm not going to cover that in this demonstration. Additionally, you could add fine gravel into the mix if you want a bumpy texture. Anyways, once you determine that the mixture is ready, we can put it into the alginate. But before we do that, we have to add a release agent. I think it's easiest to use something like this olive oil cooking spray, but you could also use petroleum jelly. Get a generous amount of release agent into the alginate because the concrete will absorb as much moisture as it possibly can. We also want our alginate mold to come off of the cement as easily as possible, and the release agent will ensure this occurs. You wouldn't have to account for this if you were using a silicone mold, and it's one of the reasons why you can't simply use a pot mold. Now then, let's pour the concrete into the alginate form. In doing so, try your best to create a very even surface. 
The exterior pop mold ensures that the alginate lays flat, which will allow you to do so. Also, pack the concrete mix firmly into the mold as to remove any potential air pockets. As is, this will have enough strength to hold its shape. However, if you would like to add an armature to create additional strength, you could use something like this knitting mesh. Let this concrete set for a good 8 hours or so. You can leave it in the mold as long as you want, but if you want to make multiple backgrounds, you will have to take it out prematurely. The longer you wait, the stronger the concrete will become. I waited about 18 hours before removing mine, and I was able to create an additional background. After the concrete is set, it can be removed from the mold. If you remember earlier, I said that the thickness of the sculpture itself was important. I made several of these and they almost always cracked when removed from the mold because they were too thin. If you want a single piece for the background, I suggest making it no thinner than a half of an inch. Although your background should peel out of the form quite easily, be careful. Any sort of torsion can easily crack the background if not fully set or if it's too thin. Alternatively, you could flip the entire structure over and then remove the molds from the background rather than the background from the molds. When your concrete is exposed, flakes of alginate might be left over in places that had undercuts. You can easily pick them off or wait till it completely dries and they should fall right off. If by some chance your background cracks when you take it out, it's not really a big deal. I will show you some cool things you can do with a broken background later on. Also, if you want to make additional backgrounds using the same mold, now is the time. You have to use that alginate mold as quickly as you can because it will shrink in no time. Let your background sit out in the open air for about 3 days. Afterward, it will be extremely hard, noticeably lighter, and the color will be pretty uniform. Now we can put this into our enclosure using some silicone. First, we must prep our glass using some rubbing alcohol. Get a paper towel covered in rubbing alcohol and scrub the area where you intend to put your background. As I said before, this will be a vertical vivarium, so I need to clean the bottom piece of glass. After you've cleaned the glass, let it sit for a little bit so that all of the alcohol can evaporate. I put two pieces of tape down so I knew where to stop applying silicone. If your background is the same size as the glass, you won't have to account for this. As always, get some 100% silicone with no additives and apply a decent amount to the pane of glass. Then gently set your background onto the silicone. Press it firmly into place and slide it back and forth a little bit. This will help get the silicone in any nooks and crannies and create a uniform seal. Finally, let the silicone cure for at least 24 hours. Afterward, you can tip your aquarium up to its proper position. As I said before, mine is going in this upright position for use in a vertical vivarium. That looks beautiful, doesn't it? What if your background broke, or you want to purposefully break it to create realistic cracks? That's simple enough, just accidentally or purposefully break your background and put the pieces back together. It creates a pretty good look, especially if that's what you want to replicate. You can even spread the pieces out slightly to create really large cracks, and then fill in the gaps with dirt or moss for example. The limits are only in your imagination. Additionally, if you make a cracked background, you can create a much thinner layer of concrete since cracking isn't a concern. Also, if you put your background back together and want to hide the cracks, you could just mix up some more concrete and patch them up. So we're basically done, but there's one more thing that we have to account for. Using concrete in aquariums is known to make the pH skyrocket. If you're using this in a vivarium, for example, this won't be as big of a deal. Regardless of your intended use, I still suggest that you rinse it a few times simply to remove any debris. Basically, we have to soak the background in water and do as many water changes as possible until the pH is stabilized. Allow the water to sit for a while in between each water change. Your best bet is to get a baseline pH level on your water prior to putting it in the tank. Then fill it up and test the water periodically to see how the concrete is affecting the pH. Once you are satisfied with the pH level, you can officially use your new background. This can take a pretty long time, but again, these backgrounds look great, so be patient with it. You could also coat the background in epoxy, for example, which would also preserve the concrete indefinitely. There are other ways that you could manually lower the pH, but I won't discuss that any further in this demonstration. 
To conclude, I suggest experimenting with your materials on a small scale prior to making your background if you haven't used any of these methods or materials before. In doing so, you can test different consistencies, thicknesses, and so on. Obviously, this background method has some serious cons, mainly that it becomes pretty heavy. If you want to do this on a larger scale, say for a 55 gallon aquarium, you would likely have to make a few sections and silicone them together like I showed you with the broken background. If that's something that you would like to see down the road, I can make it happen. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. I'll be using these techniques for some really cool applications in the near future, so stay tuned.